Obviously, our, our focus this evening is on Franciscan contemplative prayer and really focusing on prayer for busy people. So a lot of times when we think of contemplative prayer, we think of monks or cloistered nuns who have, you know, many hours each day to just focus on contemplation and meditation. And what we see in the Franciscan tradition was that, uh, especially in 16th century Spain, this contemplative prayer was developed for people with busy lives and so that they could enjoy the fruits of contemplative prayer, but within their 40 hour work week or within their busy family lives. So these were created not for people that had hours and hours a day to perfect them, but for people like probably most of you that don't have unlimited time. And so we'll kind of think about that and how we do that. Now, as we first think about prayer, so we've kind of got three elements to this, Franciscan contemplative prayer. So when we first think about prayer, we really need to think of prayer as a relationship. And so one of the kind of finest books that I've read on this is a very short book here by Archbishop Anthony Bloom. He was an archbishop in the Russian Orthodox Church. And he just wrote this little book that I've probably read, you know, three or four times. And so its, it's title is a little deceptive because yes, it does help us when we're learning how to pray or beginning to pray. But I think it's something that we can return to because there's a, a great depth to this work. And so what Anthony Bloom will keep on focusing on is prayer as a relationship. And so we're all in relationships. And I think we understand when we're in relationships that a relationship can't be totally scheduled. You know, we can't demand intimacy um, at a certain time every day or something like that. Rather, relation, intimacy is about spending time with people and, and making sure that we kind of have that focus on the importance of time, on not demanding that certain things happen, not demanding that a person or God, you know, open up as we kind of insist on, but rather what we see is just the amount of time that has to go into it, the regularity that has to go into it, the priority that has to go into it. We know that we can only have so many intimate friends and each of those relationships needs maintenance. Each of those relationships needs attention. And so we should think about our relationship with God in a similar way. It's an encounter and it requires time and it isn't mechanistic. So I'm not going to be able to kind of offer, you know, a perfect methodology that will always yield the same result every time. So this is in some ways the en enemy of Franciscan contemplative prayer, a mechanistic approach to it. This is a relationship. And another important element just of simple prayer is that you know, I think no way is necessarily better than the other. And so there's lots of forms of prayer. We, we can, you know, pray the Lord's Prayer at home. And we can say our prayers before bed. We can say the divine office. And we can say a rosary. We can go to mass. There's all different types of ways to pray. And, and they're all good. And so, um, and so we have to kind of recognize that perhaps Franciscan contemplative prayer isn't for everyone and it isn't something that people have to do. But you're all here because the title was Franciscan contemplative prayer. So that's what we will be focusing, focusing on. Contemplative prayer as one way to pray. And I think that's going to be important for us. But also recognizing like every relationship, you know, there's some people that we are attracted to and there's some that we aren't. And so we have to experiment with these things and we shouldn't feel bad if we try our best at contemplative prayer and that doesn't work for us because 
we know that there's many other ways that Franciscans pray, but this is one of them. Now, my training is in the Old Testament, so I can never give a lecture where I don't somehow work the Old Testament into it. And it's not difficult to work into this one. So as we think about contemplative prayer, we can think about Psalm 46, 11, you know, who says, be still and confess that I am God. I am exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. So I think this is at the root of contemplative prayer. Be still, and we can say confess, or I think the Hebrew is yada, be still and know that I am God. And, it, and this is what contemplative prayer really focuses on. So we see our biblical mandate here. We can also hear about this in a narrative. And so within the first book of Kings, at this basically from chapters 18 to 24, we hear lots of stories of Elijah. Actually, anyone who's been going to Mass during the week or reading the, the readings for the first reading has been reading all about Elijah. Today we had him from Ben Sirah or the Book of Sirach. And so Elijah is a major figure, and Elijah had kind of many ups and downs in his um, ministry, in his time kind of working for the Lord. And so we, so we read in chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, about a time when Elijah has escaped from the northern kingdom of Israel. So he'd been up by Mount Carmel, battling with King Ahab, battling with the prophets of Baal, and, um, and then he was just kind of overcome and he fled to Mount Horeb, which would be probably in, in current day Saudi Arabia, at the very north of Saudi Arabia, perhaps in the Sinai Peninsula. We can't be certain. And we hear that at the end of that time, he kind of goes to the mountain and we read, then the Lord said, go outside and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will be passing by. A strong and heavy wind was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a tiny whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, why are you here? So this, I think, too, is one of the imperatives for contemplative prayer. Um, we live, you know, in a society that's kind of full of lots of noise and spectacular things. And oftentimes, you know, we hear a lot of spectacular um, stories about the Lord. And we'll look for the Lord, you know, in Pentecost and, and flames and spectacular acts, or we'll look for the Lord in miracles. And there's many ways that the Lord is present to us, but here in both of these readings from the Old Testament, we see the Lord present to us, you know, in something that's easy to miss, in something that's very quiet. And, and we kind of get this imperative in the Psalm to be still, and then we see Elijah experiencing many things, but finding the Lord in something that would be very easy to miss. And so contemplative prayer, I think, is about kind of focusing a little bit on those things that could be easy to miss and, um, and kind of taking the time and slowing down and being still. Now, another very important aspect of Franciscan contemplative prayer is this connection with Elijah. And so if we look at some of the earliest traditions about St. Francis, um, we'll see that he's very much connected um, with um, the Crusades and being a presence of peace within the Crusades and visiting the Sultan in Egypt. And so in these depictions of his visit, which are explained to us um, by St. Bonaventure, that's probably the first place where we get a real strong explanation of these, we see St. Francis interacting with the Sultan, and we see the images that are very similar to Elijah. And so, so Francis, in many respects, is a new Elijah. So, so therefore, 
Francis does a lot of the things that Elijah does. One of our great Franciscan values is mendicancy, kind of a very, a word that we don't use very often, but a word that means kind of moving around. And so if we think of monks, they're kind of the opposite of, of mendicants because they take a vow of stability. They stay at their abbey. People go and visit them at their abbey. But when we think about Elijah, he was running all over ancient Israel and much of, you know, the ancient Near East. So we see him up you know, by the Lebanon border um, in current terms, then going down to um, the area probably around Sinai Peninsula or Saudi Arabia. Then we see him over in the area that would be Syria today. So he moved around in his ministry and met many people in many different places. That's exactly what Francis does as well. So he doesn't stay in one place. He's associated with the CC, but he's outside of the CC. And of course we see here, him depicted here in Egypt. We know he went to Rome. We know he went in many different places. So we see that kind of mendicancy with him. Now, we just heard about Elijah on the mountain, you know, experiencing the Lord. We know St. Francis had similar desires. And so we think often of Laverna, this mountain that was given as a gift to St. Francis. Um, Another thing that we'll see depicted here very clearly is Francis dealing with a king. So Elijah was dealing with, with King Ahab, kind of a wicked king. And the Sultan here, we kind of tried to redeem a little bit, but there was a lot of concern about him as well. And clearly he was on the opposite side of the Christians. Francis found a way to be with him that was a lot better than Elijah found to be with King Ahab. But we see that as an important element. And then the final element is this kind of testing of fire. So we see the fire present in both these scenes, things that Francis is not afraid of. And we know Elijah was very um, much tested by fire as well. So when he was arguing with the prophets of Baal, fire was an important experience there. And then ultimately he went into his fiery chariot at the end of his life. So so Elijah then is a model of prayer for us that we see Francis can be associated with. So now as we try to think a little bit more about contemplative prayer, one of the great masters in the Franciscan um, tradition is this book here, Francisco de Asuna, The Third Spiritual Alphabet. It's one of the Paulist classics. Um, it's a huge book. I can't say that I've read all of it, but I have read parts of it, and this is an essential guide um, for contemplative prayer. And Francisco de Asuna was important in his time, and he was a great influence on both um, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, um, who were great um, practitioners of contemplative prayer. They would do it a little bit differently than Franciscans, but there was heavy Franciscan influence on both of them. And so as we think of the goal of contemplative prayer, we have this kind of lofty goal of union with God. And um, I can't say that's something that I've really ever experienced. It's, it's a great goal. Um, but when I read of some of mystical writings and their experiences there, those aren't experiences that I've had. I think we can think of union with God, though, in a way that is an experience that we can have a little more easily. And that's really trusting in Christ's presence within us. And so, so I think that's very important. And I, I think Franciscan contemplative prayer really tries to kind of guide us or direct us in that direction of trusting in Christ's presence within us. So as I was watching all the faces pop up at the beginning, I saw some friends there and I saw many people that I didn't know, but some of the people that I've previously spoken before might be familiar with one of my favorite stories, but I think this story kind of helps us get at this goal. And um, this is a story about some children. They were basically four-year-olds and they were um, participants in an experiment at um, psychology labs in Stanford up in the Bay Area. 
and they wanted to kind of understand how children make moral reasoning. So they started by, they needed to find a special group of four-year-olds. They needed to find a group of four-year-olds who hate broccoli. So not the hardest thing to find. So they found all these four-year-olds and they put them in a room and, um, and they had this little kind of, it was like one of these police dramas where there was a window that they were looking through, but on the other side, it was a mirror. So the people on the other side of the room weren't aware of being observed. And in the other side of the room, they had all these children playing. And so they had children playing with trucks. They had children doing arts and crafts, finger painting. They had children playing with Legos, all kinds of different things. So they were having a great time doing all kinds of projects. And then they paid a child actress, a little bit older than the other children, to go in there and basically just be kind of a little brat. And so she would kind of go around and she'd see this finger painting that some of the children had done. And she would say, this is the worst art I've ever seen, you know? Or then she would see some Legos that they'd put together and she'd just step on it and break it. Um, and then, and so she just kind of went around alienating herself, performing her role very well. And, and so at the end of her time, she said, we're about to get, get some treats and we're gonna have my favorite treat, broccoli. So with that, the doors opened to all the children that were observing this. And they had you know, cookies and cupcakes and all kinds of goodies, but they also had a plate of broccoli. And so all the children walked over there and they had some cookies, they had some cupcakes, they had some goodies, and they descended on the broccoli and they ate every last bit of broccoli. And they said some of the children even had tears coming down their face because they hated broccoli, but they hated one thing more than broccoli, and that was injustice. And these are young children, and they've even done experiments with children younger than that and found the same basic instinct. And so I think that's important for us, is that we have to understand that we're made in the image and likeness of God, as we hear very clearly in Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, and that Christ is within us. But we can live in a society oftentimes that wants to focus us on different things. And clearly this has always been a problem that people get focused on different things. And I think contemplative prayer is trying to draw us back into that, to trust in Christ's presence within us. And so we do that in a number of ways. And the first thing that we try to do is we try to recollect ourselves. And so this is really, you know, collecting our capacities or faculties in a way that allows us to focus on the presence of Christ within. And so if you're anything like me, when you begin to pray, your mind is jumping all over the place. I think the, the Buddhists call this monkey mind. We are thinking about, you know, a thousand different things. And so then you kind of settle down and you say, okay, I'm going to be quiet and you know try to have co contemplation for the next 20 minutes and you know maybe you're better than me but my mind keeps on jumping around and all of a sudden i'm thinking about okay i have to have a conversation with this person today and this is what i'm going to say and then they're going to say this and and then i want to reach over and write it down and you know i've figured it all out but this is the great danger we have to keep on recollecting ourselves we have to keep on thinking about Christ's presence within us. And so we do this in lots of different ways. Um, but I think the important thing is we start our prayer, and before that, we can have, before we actually engage contemplative prayer, we can start with a little bit of, you know, a, you know, a scripture passage that we like, or the rosary, or whatever it is that gets us into that frame. And then we move into prayer, and we keep on trying to you know, recollect ourselves, to collect ourselves, to stop trying to figure everything out, ultimately to stop trying to think, to do all these ways to just kind of be with God and to re recognize, you know, that we've been made in the image and likeness of God, that we can trust in Christ's presence within us. Now, one of the, I think, uniquely Franciscan aspects to this is that 
other traditions oftentimes just want us to kind of think of nothing. And they want a lot of what we can say is, um, you know, apathetic prayer, which is prayer that kind of focuses on darkness or silence. Um, whereas the Franciscan tradition will engage imagery. And so we know this all, you know, there's usually a send down on a cross somewhere in a Franciscan place. And when we think of the great contributions of Franciscan spirituality, we see that we have seized upon the stations of the cross, things that we can touch and kiss. We've seized upon and the baby Jesus at Greccio in his crib. And these are all very important things. And so we can also think about, you know, how Christ is present with us. And so this can be kind of a discursive meditation. And for me, one of the things that I like to do is just imagine myself, you know, with Christ at the crucifix, at, the, at his crucifixion, that somehow I want to support him. And I think about him and I think about that scene. And I even sometimes just place my hand on his leg somehow to support him in his humanity, in his difficulties. And people can choose whatever scene they want. But I think that helps kind of get us away from our mind jumping around all the time and gets us to be with Christ. And ultimately then that allows us, I think, to um, move to the second stage and that's the stage of quiet. And so as we think about quiet, um, that's going to be kind of a very important stage after we kind of have that initial stage of recollecting ourselves. So to, you know, emphasize, you know, the importance of stilling or quiet, what we heard, I think, in, in the psalm. And we want to still our intellectual activities. Ultimately, we want to still our imagination. So at one point, we use our imagination to maybe get us away from our problems, to get us away from some of the things that are, um, you know, disturbing us um, from contemplation. And once we get to the quiet, then we have to kind of keep on nurturing that. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the kind of most important moves for us is to really kind of have a sense of quiet and to kind of be in that space. And um, so, you know, from a positive perspective, you know, we're kind of trying to move there. We're trying to appreciate the quiet. We're not trying to think about the quiet and how do I get that quiet and what that quiet is going to give me or anything like that. We just try to just slow down our minds, slow down our intellectual activity during this time. So there's lots of great times for intellectual activity, but this is a time when we kind of can get to the quiet. And so certainly my experiences, I don't get there well, every time I try, I engage in, in, in contemplative prayer. Um, but that is kind of one of the kind of the goals to, to kind of get to that quiet and to experience that quiet. Um, and so, so a lot of this then is, you know, really kind of understanding what God desires for us. You know, that, that God wants us to experience God's goodness. God's generosity. And ultimately, I think the quiet then allows us to be able to kind of go back to the world and refreshed, able to be quiet at other times, able to listen at other times. And so I think this is what we saw so strongly in Elijah's experience. All these spectacular things were happening around him. And if he didn't have an appreciation for quiet, and he would have just got stuck on those spectacular things. And people love to hear about spectacular things, and spectacular things are great. There's no doubt about that. But I think what Franciscan contemplative prayer is introducing to us is kind of the wholeness of our experience, the wholeness of the world, and that maybe we won't be able to have spectacular experiences. And maybe there's limitations in our lives or difficulties in our lives that don't allow us to really grab a hold of those. 
But I think quiet is something that we can all um, reach. It's something that we can all try to find a place for. Now, that too can be a challenge. There's no doubt. I, where I currently live, you know, there's there's there doesn't seem to be really good noise ordinances. So I I I, I think about this during my prayer in the morning, because generally around, you know, once we get close to seven o'clock in the morning, there's leaf blowers going, there's other things going. But this morning it started right at six thirty, you know, and so I was just just kind of frustrated, you know, that, oh, I want this quiet and I'm listening to that. But then once that leaf blower goes off, all of a sudden, you know, kind of, you really appreciate the quiet. And so, so we believe as, as Franciscans that, you know, Christ is within us and we have to quiet ourselves down at times because I think there's lots of, of kind of signs that that might not be the case, that, you know, our materialistic culture and our advertising generated culture wants us to worry that we're not good enough, that somehow um, we have to do more in order to um, get more or to be better or to be good. And this prayer is the exact opposite of that, you know, that we're focused on being made in the image and likeness of God. We're focused on God being happy with us and that God is already within us. We just have to kind of keep on coming back to that and appreciating that. So that quiet then is very important. Um, so another important aspect of this is that there isn't a strong kind of methodology for this prayer. And this is where, you know, we have to kind of avoid the mechanism that I kind of mentioned at the beginning. So what we're being kind of introduced to is a relationship, is um, spending time. So, so I think probably the only method really in this is just the need to, to give time to this, that we can't rush this, that we can't um, fit this all into kind of two minutes or something like that, but that, that if we, the more we can value our relationship with God, it's just like anyone else who we really value their relationship. If we really want to be around someone and we're not just kind of saying, okay, I'm giving you three minutes here and two minutes there and four minutes there, but we find blocks of time. And so Franciscan contemplative prayer, I think is really about finding those blocks of time to really kind of slow down and to ultimately kind of turn off our thinking, to turn off our intellect and to, be with God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is within us that we've been baptized. So, so once, so, so a lot of this lecture, you know, I've kind of based on an essay in this book, Franciscans at Prayer. Um, so this is a book that came out, I think, four or five years ago. And our own brother, Bill Short, a faculty member here at the Franciscan School of Theology, wrote a wonderful essay called From Contemplation to Inquisition, the Franciscan practice of recollection in 16th century Spain. And so, so Brother Bill kind of was able to kind of diagnose this time um, as a time where there was just an awful lot of attention given to contemplative prayer by Franciscans. Um, with the changes in the church, with the various councils that came, especially Trent, um, a lot of times this prayer kind of went off our radar a little bit, or we decided we were going to kind of let um, monks be the major contemplatives. But what Brother Bill kind of points out so clearly is the strong tradition of this within the Franciscan, um, within Franciscan, the Franciscan world. So the Franciscans at this time in Spain had lots of houses of recollection and um, and probably more importantly, they taught this recollection. So, so it wasn't meant for just those people living in, in the certain Franciscan houses. Those houses were able to kind of spend a lot of time on that, but then it was taught. And so this is where we see um, the great saints of 16th century Spain, Teresa of Avila and Juan de la Cruz or John of the Cross, you know, very much in dialogue with this tradition. And so, so a very important aspect of this is 
you know, rather than kind of a methodology, rather than kind of something that you're working really hard at, and it's all about grace, desire, and love. And so, so I think that what I really kind of focus on here is this sense of desire. What does our heart want? And to kind of realize that, you know, probably God has put that into our heart. And so another word for desire that's very important in the Franciscan world is will. You know, what, where does our will kind of point us? In other theological traditions, um, you know, there's a great emphasis just on the intellect. And, but within the Franciscan world, there's always going to be the intellect and the will. And those two things kind of work together. And I would say the will is probably more important because we can certainly achieve understanding and, and achieve kind of an intellectual mastery of things. But without our will pointing us in the right direction in terms of how to use that, um, one can understand perfectly kind of moral behavior and still do the wrong thing because our desire isn't there. And so this prayer, I think, is very much based on our desire, that we want to be with the Lord, that we want to be people that are recollected, that in kind of good times and bad times, we're able to um, walk with others um, in a certain manner, that we're always able to see the goodness in the world, that we're always able to see everyone made in the image and likeness of God. You know, tomorrow, um, and maybe some of you are already in tomorrow where you're um, watching this, um, we celebrate um, the solemnity um, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And there we focus very much on, um, I think it's, it, we focus very much on um, the kind of humility of Jesus. You know, the Jesus who's not putting burdens on us, but wants rather to be with us, to, desires to be with us. And so, so this contemplative prayer is, I think, a prayer very much about kind of following our heart, about not kind of forcing things in, but rather we've got a desire to have a deeper relationship with God. We give it the time and we ultimately come to see Christ's presence within us. So, so then this goal of, of, of kind of union with God, of being able to see Christ's presence within us, ultimately is this kind of idea of intimacy with God, that, you know, we're able to share um, our burdens, share our difficulties, and um, that we're willing to kind of take time, even though maybe we're not kind of getting what we want from our petitionary prayers, and um, that we still realize the great importance of just kind of allocating that time. And then ultimately, I think, contemplating on the life of Jesus as we try to move into kind of deeper and deeper prayer. But also, I think, recognizing the great challenge that is. Um, I, you know, I've seen surveys, and certainly I think this is my experience, you know, for whatever amount of time we allot towards kind of silence and quiet and kind of calming ourselves down, our mind is probably wandering about half of that time. And so we keep on coming back, I think, to Christ's presence within us. We find an image, I think, that's important for us. That can be Jesus on the cross. That could be the baby Jesus. And another, you know, favorite image of mine is the wedding feast of Cana, where, you know, this couple are down and out and, um, and about to be kind of publicly humiliated. And all of a sudden, Jesus and Mary are there with them to support them. So that in the most difficult times, um, you know, Jesus enters into our lives. And so, so contemplative prayer is, is really kind of, kind of, I think, helping us to see that, is remembering the times that Jesus has done that in other lives, and then ultimately trying to find that quiet um, that allows us 
to simply be, you know, simply be still and know that I am God. And I think this is the imperative of contemplative prayer. And, and then we find kind of all these practices that are rooted in our desire, that are rooted in God's love for us, that are rooted in grace or God's gifts of goodness to us. And I think the more we can see what God has done for us, and the more then we are kind of wrapped back into contemplative prayer, to spending time, you know, with God, and to valuing that time, and to not making too many demands of that time. You know, we live in a kind of capitalistic culture, and um, where efficiency is rewarded. I think prayer is, is very different than that. It doesn't have to be efficacious. It doesn't have to be, you know, results, results, results. It's much more about a relationship. And so those, you know, so just think of people that you've been in a relationship for a long time. And, you know, you just foster that relationship. And there's times when you're simply quiet. And there's times when you're able to get support, but maybe there's difficult times as well. And so we just trust in this relationship with God, and we have all these images before us of God um, meeting us and being with us and loving us. So I think that's probably, you know, where I want to end, you know, focused on, you know, union with God and trusting in God's presence in us and seeing, you know, those biblical imperatives that keep on showing us that that is where we can kind of hang our hat and take confidence.